Okay, this is a platter blanket. It's quarter sawn, and I don't even know what kind of wood it is. If I look at it, that's my dating system. It says 1-5. Uh, so <laughs> that's January of 2005. So this is good and dry. Um, it looks to be box elder, but it could be some other maple of some sort. Uh, but this will make a great uh, platter, and I'm going to just chuck it up. Uh, I've got a bunch of weird little chucking methods you're going to see right here. How should I do this? I'll wing it. Uh, I'll, let's throw that up against there. Ooh, boy. I know the screw was bent there, now it's straight. And <laughs> uh, like I said, good and dry, and it's quarter sawn. Uh, quarter sawn is important for an item like this. Uh, why? Um, Pat, I'm gonna bother you again to look here. Uh, hang on, give me a second. So there, we are out cutting there out in, the, out in the field, and if I'm making platters, I'm, I'm, I'm making platters out of the tree that came out just like this. There's my platter blank right there. Okay, so that you can see that was a fairly large tree in order to get that. It was double that size, easy. Okay, because the annual rings are going through that board, guess what, in a straight line. So if you make your platter blank over here, your rings are really long sloping arcs. Okay, well, so what? What happens to that item? Well, regardless of the base diameter, when that piece gets wet and dry, it shrinks just like a cotton t-shirt. Therefore, it's gonna cup. This, this particular piece will cup just like this. That flat board will look like that over time. Okay, you, that, that piece right there won't do that. It'll stay flat. Okay, everybody with me? Mm -hmm. So what is quarter sawn? Just draw it up. These are all quarter sawn pieces of wood. There's tons of quarters in a log like this. The reason you pay more money for quarter, quarter sawn wood is because you have more waste and more strategy cutting the board. Uh, that's why, that's why that happens. Any questions before I make noise? Tony, you got some sandpaper coming for me? Yeah. Okay. All right, so I've got a 5 h inch bolt guide. By the way, I'm just gonna pass around. This tool here has two grinds on it, the two grinds I'm using tonight. These are the same grinds I use on all my tools. This tool is actually used in my shop on every lathe. I have this sitting right in the headstock there with magnets and I use this tool uh, just as a detailer so I'll, I'll be cutting with one side and I'll flip the tool over and cut with the other uh, just to do some dainty clean cleaning cuts. Thank you. What do you got? Just leave it flat there. And I'll get it. Thank you very much. All right, here we go. I'm going to make noise. I use this piece as a jam chuck somewhere. That little groove right there uh, chucked up something earlier. So it was just used as a some form of jig. That's not good. That just slipped in the chuck. I'll get this nice and true. And now I'm going to form the shape. Oh, that's too bad. Oh, you know what? That's not my chuck. That's a lathe. Okay. Maybe I can tighten up that belt. That's the first place we'll go. If not, I will decrease the speed. Yeah, that's on there pretty tight. Let's crunch it down a little bit. If that doesn't work, we'll try something else. It didn't work. Okay, so I'm on the highest speed here, so I'm going to drop that down to low. Hopefully that's going to give me a little more torque. What problem are you having? Um, the, 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 it's on the, its highest RPM level, so the belt pulleys just don't give me as much torque as I'd like. So I put it down onto the lower speed that I'll get more surface area but less RPM, which should be okay for this item. And now it doesn't spin nearly as fast, 
Let's crank it up and see. But now I should get a lot more torque. A lot isn't saying a lot. But that's enough. So the belt pulley system there means a lot to the strength of this lathe. This probably has a one and a half horsepower motor. If you increase that to five horsepower, you don't do anything to, this, to the torque of this until you change the configuration of the pulleys. Putting a bigger motor in it won't help. This is a series of just relatively harsh scraping failures here. I'm just cutting all the band or the chainsaw marks off of it. Okay, let's set up our base. That's that's 50% base right there, so that's not bad. Don't want to get any smaller than that. A little smaller won't hurt. All right, let's take a look. Let me just make sure the wood sound. Everybody seeing okay? All right. Yeah, some good figure in there. That looks to be, ooh, I, yeah, silver maple, that's all that is, yeah. You see a lot of torn grain there. That's all gonna go away before uh, I sand it. We'll make some cleaner cuts here in a minute. But right now I'm gonna develop a little tenon here to chuck this up. Not my favorite way to do it, but it's all I've got. Uh, if I was at home, I would be using a, a chuck right there to grip that, that's, that tenon right there. Uh, I didn't bring that chuck with me. So that's a scrape cut. Uh, not gonna leave the wood very nice, but that's okay. I'm not trying to do that right now. Gonna find my jig here. This has the dimension of the exterior of my chuck closed all the way. So I'm going to make a mark there. Okay. That's where my recess will be. So when my chuck open, my chuck is going to be completely closed and it'll fit in that groove. And when I open it up, it barely moves. And I do that for a reason because I want the best hold, number one. But if you have to scroll that chuck open, you'll mar the, the indent that I put in there. Uh, and I don't want to do that because this is going to be its final resting place. Um, I've got a, sp a spindle gouge here, and I'll cut that in. And I'll only go in about a sixteenth of an inch. I don't need much here to chuck at all. You don't want to dig in there really deep with this method because it'll look like a, a production uh, technique, and that never looks good on your work. You never want to show the public how you chuck something up. Although they probably don't care. I'm, I'm thinking because I, I know it's, if I walk up to your booth at a show and you and you showed me where you chuck things up, I not that I've turned off by it, it's just I, I wish you would have hi, hid it from me. Um, so there's the recess um, that I'm going to do. And I, I passed that tool around, that double-ended tool. Did that get very far? It made it all, all the way back there. We'll keep, up, keep it going. I'll need that in a minute. Uh, I'll use that as a straight edge, but I'm also going to use it as a, a way to cut the surface. That's interesting. There's a time delay there. Only on yours, not on theirs. Oh, okay, good. Okay, mine, why is mine got a time delay? Because it goes through the computer first. <laughs> all right, cool. Uh, so I'm going to, you can see these, the, my tool is fairly sharp, but it left all that wood uh, really buggered up. Uh, that tool coming up here? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I do need that tool. That I thought I wouldn't need it. Um, did you notice uh, the uh, one? One's a bowl gouge and one's a spindle gouge. Um, let me just show it to you on the camera there. Spindle gouge is what just did this cut. I used this tool just like that. Oh, Oops. All right. there, there. Just like that. And that, as this piece rotates, that's a lot of ingrained fiber that that fingernail gouge has to contend with. And I also used it like that to cut in here, okay? Well, um, and that tool that I used is very sharp. Um, take a look at that surface right there. And I, I don't have a lot to 
cut off. But remember what that looks like. Now, there's my fingernail gouge. That's what caused that surface, and it's a good sharp tool. I'm going to flip this tool over, and now I've got the traditional gouge. Uh, I'm not even sure if this is all that sharp. And look at the pigtail that comes off of that. And now, let's take a look at that surface. Let's see if we can't cut to that piece where it was. Right. Yes? Uh, bevel oh, bevel's always running, yes, it has to, if you want a clean cut like that. So that, you'd hate to even touch that up with sandpaper because it's cut so clean. Uh, that's what that tool buys you, okay? Why don't we use this tool for everything? Because it doesn't have a point on it, okay? So th if I flip the tool over, there's your point. That point is a nice area to make contact with the wood because it gives you control. This tool doesn't have a point, so when I touched, you notice I was really kind of eased into it because it likes to skate around because it, the, the turning object is trying to put the tool into a, a leveling situation. So everybody with me there? So I hope you get to use this traditional gouge. Pat, back up and let's look at this surface here. Let's look at that one there. Okay, remember what that looks like. You see a lot of ridging there. Uh, the, that, see that uh, spiral there? If you wonder what that is, that's good clean cut wood, but there's a, a bounce across the cut. What is that bounce? Well, flip the tool back over here and you look at the length of that bevel right there. And that length of that is each one of those ridges, okay? So it's a, it's a scoring and a tension line. To lower that, you would probably just shorten that bevel, just knock that bevel in half, and you'd get less of that visual uh, spiral, okay? It's just a good tip to know. In this scenario, I'm going to just use the traditional gouge. So I use the fingernail gouge in here to, to make a little dovetail that will fit my chuck back in there. But the problem with using this tool there, it won't make that cut. It'll hit right there on that ridge. But I'll take this now and go right into the dead center. Run the bevel. Look at the pigtail. That pigtail tells you that you're always cutting clean. Right to the dead center there. And now, when we go across that surface, not a whole lot of area there that has to be sanded. You just touch it up lightly with a little bit of uh, 120, 180, and you're good. Because uh, that area, you don't want to sand a lot because you don't want to hit that edge right there because that's where you're going to chuck up against. And that edge is a little broken there that needs to be cleaned up. But I'll get to that right now. Let's do that. So I'm just going to cut a little detail there that makes it look like it's a detail. It's not made to chuck there. So it's kind of a visual uh, spot that keeps people from understanding how I, I got to, to make this object. And I'm kind of buggering it up there now. Let's see how that worked and then uh, we'll get on to something else. Any questions on that? Because you, you, I know there's a lot of questions on that. Uh, and then I'll check for my uh, depth here. Make sure nothing touches the table, but right here and here, it's a little close for comfort right there. I'd knock that down just a bit. It'll make me feel better. And then I can probably just stop about right there. I will call that a detail. And then I'll nib that off and clean that. So it looks like I meant to do that. Okay there? So why did I leave that bolt there? Because when I finally do make this piece and the, <laughs> the interior won't seem so tinny if I tapped it and it was thin there, tick, 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 the more bulk down in here, the better, okay? So now that area is all done. Let's come out here. Look at this torn grain here. Hang on. Yeah, I'll get you that, Pat. No, I don't want to rush you. Look at all this surface here. That, that's not torn grain, it's just dust. But this area here, that's torn grain. What are we going to do to get rid of that? Well, I scraped it to start. I'll scrape it again, but I'm going to scrape it at a shear scrape level. Mm -hmm. Tool rest out of the way. So this is how I cut that originally. Uh, boy, Pat, we'll have to go to the other camera. 
See that? The, the angle of the tool is going to scrape. I'm going to take the tool and put that handle in my left pocket, in this case, and then just peel at the wood. So the angle of attack is a lot steeper. I'll come over here. I'm not getting, but I'm getting nice ribbon fibers there, even though my tool is not real, tool is not really sharp. It still does a pretty good job as long as the, the tip of the tool is at a sheer plane. So it's not scraping the surface. Anybody unclear on that? Ask now. People have a tendency to put this tool in their hip. So they would put the tool in their hip here, and that would leave the tool at a horizontal plane to touch the wood. I take it and tilt it up so it peels at the wood. And now hopefully that surface is cut a lot cleaner. Uh, there's still some broken surface there. That's where my walnut oil would come in nicely. I'd lubricate that surface and then cut over it. Uh, here's what I'm going to have to do now. I'm going to sharpen this tool and then go over it. That's always the first thing to do. So let's try that again. Remember what that looks like. There's all kinds of things that we can try here. So a lighter cut at a hot, steeper shear plane. And it, yeah, like I said, the walnut oil would knock this right out, but I don't have that. Okay, let's take a look. There's more to do, that's for sure. Uh, that certainly helped. That's where all that torn green was. There's still some there. Uh, the other alternative, of course, would have been to use my traditional gouge and I probably would have gone from here out. Uh, and that's a, that's a very skillful item to do. That's why I'm not doing it yet. I may have to go to that, but let's try this. A little bit more here. Always go with the easiest and laziest way to cut first. Oh, that's bad. I just broke a bunch of grain there. The tool kind of fell off the rest. check that and then uh, hopefully I'll be doing some sand in here. Any questions anybody? Yes? Does, does dampening the surface of the wood with water, does that help also with, with uh, Water not so much. I've used water a lot. Just never as good a lubricant as something that's slippery. Or, yeah, water doesn't work. The analogy would be, yeah, w shaving with water is a little better than dry, but that soap really makes the difference. Yep. Question there. Do you have that tool almost completely closed when you're... Yeah, uh, there's the tool at uh, 12 o'clock right there, so the flute is pointed at the roof. I take that tool and it's almost the left side is almost touching now. See if you can see it that way. See if you can look at it there, so right there. So it's hitting on the underside there and almost closed on itself. So that gets a really to a, a, a sheer point. Phil? Yeah, uh, my hands aren't going to be doing this cut. My body will. So let's do it one more time. So I've got myself set up here. The tool's in my left pocket in this case. And then as I go across this surface, my, my shoulders are shifting across to make that cut. Because my hands really can't do a very good job of it. If my hands do it, there would be a whole bunch of fits and starts. So I. I Whatever that distance is, my shoulders got there and moved that distance. Because if the hands are loose on their own, there's a whole bunch of different hinges here that are hard to control um, to get to work together all at once. Okay, that part, all that is ready and done. Um, if you don't mind, I'll sand that piece now. I'm gonna have to wear a dust mask because I do have this dust allergy thing going. Um, oh, you got one? 
I do. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I'll take it. Nick sold me some at the at the uh, swap meet. Good old. He Nick. guaranteed that they would keep me from <laughs> from uh, hacking here. When did you discover the dust? Well, I've been uh, I've been traveling, as you may know. I travel a lot in teak wood turning, and the uh, for years I've been coming home off the airplane and getting sick uh, with sinus infections, and. Um, it's gotten to a point where I, I basically just stopped tra uh, traveling. Not I have it, but I always you hate to turn down the good gigs. You know, if somebody invites you to go to somewhere special, you you want to go to those. But um, I've really had to slow up my travel plan plans because every time I get home, I get sick. Um, so uh, I did a few things to figure out what caused it, and sure enough. Every every time I'm around a dusty area, I I get uh, I get flu-like symptoms, very unpleasant. And, uh, uh, and then I went and talked to a, a dermatologist about the situation, and uh, turns out uh, I, I do need to find out what type of dust bothers me. But from right now, all I know it's all dust. Okay, skip the grid on you, didn't I? Oh, this is good. 150 is good to start here. So I'll slow up the lathe here to sand. Notice I hold, I took the sandpaper, folded it into thirds. That keeps the my sandpaper gives it a lot more longevity. Keeps the heat down. And I'm not going to rub out my details here. What causes sandpaper to, to hurt itself is if, if I took this paper right here and I, I, I see a lot of people just take that paper and throw it right up against the wood there, you've just destroyed the paper because that heat's going to build up immediately and knock the, the sharpness right off of the paper. And I, I'm very particular about sandpaper because it costs so much. And a lot of you folks know me, I'm pretty cheap. <coughs> What's that? Well, this has a readout that says 532, and I think it's off. It, I bet it's more like 538. <laughs> but the, I always slow it down considerably because that's what builds up your heat. So I think I turned this at 1200 RPMs. I'm down to 500 here to sand. So there's 150, a little bit of rub there. Some 220. And this, we'll just call this a little cheese tray. <coughs> By the way, <coughs> at home, I would spray between each grit. I would take a high pressure air and knock all the 150 grit off the wood because that's going to destroy the next paper coming up because grit also breaks off and gets into the wood and that destroys your paper and I also move the paper around quite a bit so the heat doesn't build up and then uh, I discard it and I'm always willing and happy to use Tony's paper when I, when I have the opportunity because he paid for it 220 again, like I said. Um, there, Vic Wood, uh, who was at two years ago's wood turning symposium, he always said, use sandpaper like somebody else has bought it. And that, that's an important thing to remember because it's true. A lot of us use sandpaper way past its life. Question? He sells sandpaper. Vic Wood sells Yeah, he might sell sandpaper. I don't know. He's an Australian. Oh, I'm thinking somebody else. He probably did somewhere along his career. Most wood turners have always sold something other than wood turners to make a living. <laughs> Anybody questions? Throw them out. I got one more grit to go. How about using uh, the paper on a drill with Velcro? Yeah, I, that's a great way to sand. I power sand everything at home. In this case, I would. Was, who asked that question? Oh, great. Um, the, yeah, I would use a uh, three-inch disc sander and sand this whole piece. Yeah, that would be great. 
That's what I do at home. This way is way too slow. This takes a lot of time. What do you wear for dust protection? I have a respirator, uh, one of those 3M high-end jobbies uh, that have a little 12-hour battery um, <clears throat> that feeds me clean air all day. So when I'm at home, I never have this problem with dust allergies because I don't get dust at home. I get dust when I'm out traveling and teaching. <clears throat> Okay, that's good enough. So we call that good, and then, uh, well, I'm keeping you guys out late. So I know because it's way past my bedtime. No. Uh, so that part's done, and then the inside's going to be real down and dirty and easy. Let me take out that screw. Questions, anybody, while we're working here? What jig do you use for the, uh, at the very end of the bottom? Uh, what's that? The, at the very end, uh, the, when you're doing the very last touch on the bottom, what jig are you using? Um, when I flip around and do this? After you've done the inside. Yeah. And then you're flipping around for the, the very final thing on the bottom. I, what jig do you use? I, I wouldn't be using any jig. Right now, this is exactly how it's done. It's finished right now. So I won't be coming back to it. That's why I detailed that fairly clean, so it looks like it's a detail that I meant to do, other than uh, me, me actually um, um, using it as a chuck. Right now, that's a chucking device, but it looks like a detail that I meant to put in the piece. Um, and on some of the other ones that you pass around, they're very big. I was just wondering what kind of a jig do you use for that? Um, I don't use a jig. Uh, if I, what I would use at home um, would be uh, I have a chuck that would actually grip those big attendants. So I would never have to touch them. I would cut just a sixteenth of an inch of a dowel or a tenon and grip on it, and that would, that would be good. I would never flip these around, uh, even though I don't, I'm not averse to it at all. I think it's a good idea. Um, I, I just wouldn't do it for me because uh, it, that just means I'm going to have more time and money into it. So were those custom-made chucks? Or? No, Vic Mark makes those. They're, they're they're, cus uh, they're, they're sold just like that. You just got to ask for them. They probably don't advertise them in their... Um, <coughs> their me the Mega Jaws are the ones. They go six, seven, eight, nine, and maybe yeah. ten, I think. I've gri I can grip 12-inch tenons with my, yeah. with my chuck. Uh, most, most chuck manufacturers don't offer them, but Vicmark does. Okay, let's knock this out. We'll call that well, done as soon as I get the hall, interior hauled. So I'm gripping on just a sixteenth of an inch there that I expanded in. Not a lot. So I'm going to use the tailstock here. Interesting. <coughs> tailstock just gave up the ghost. Okay, let's try that. Okay. All right, true it up. I don't want to touch much here on the rim. That rim's kind of thin as it is. A series of scrapes. Get rid of this bulk in the middle. Right now, I just wanted to get that bulk out of the way so I can make a little bit of detail here. Leave all that bulk there as long as you can because it's hard to make these cuts here if it's flimsy. So I'm just, I see a little bit of detail problem here that I just want to look at. 
before I keep going. A little bit just a hair thinner than I'd wanted it. Crisp up this detail here to invite the eye to look in. Take a look at that, make sure those details are crisp. I see a little bit of tool marking right there. Actually, at least the piece I'm looking at, I don't know if you can, boy. Well, I've got a nice little monitor in there that shows me a nice tool mark in there. I'm not sure you can see it. Maybe it's because I'm too close up. Here. I'll clean that up right here with a shear scrape. That's not good. That high pitch sound is translating the there's a chatter on the wood. That's okay, you just got by it. Okay. Now I'll use a smaller bowl gouge to cut the interior up. I, I'm, actually, I better turn it off and make sure I'm done there before I hollow anymore. Still have a tool mark. Okay, I think that did it. Now let's hollow out. Check my thickness. Very good. Okay, I got plenty more to do to go. Bit of torn grain there. That's difficult. Okay. Now we'll make a lot of noise. And I'm cutting downhill like this. Because that is a lot easier cut to make than to go directly at the center. That's a brutal cut that I wouldn't make because it takes too much energy and it destroys the edge of your tool. And this way I get ribbon. That way I get powder. Okay, I'm going to finish up here. Before I remove that bulk, I'll finish this surface here. Lighter cut now. Okay, I'll check that curve, make sure all the wood's cut clean, and then I'll just remove out that whole interior bulk. A little bit of broken grain there, that's caused by the, the figure, but I'm gonna live with that, because I know without any walnut oil there, it's not gonna, not gonna go, go away. One other little detail I've missed, this little ridge here. That's taken care of. What's that, Gary? I would put the oil right on the wood, and that would lubricate that surface and knock that uh, broken grain down.
sounds a little thin. I should have taken that into consideration. I wasn't even really looking. But the last thing you want is a, a thin platter. Because uh, if it sounds really tinny, nobody's going to want to use it. That, there, you're going to knock the utility right out of the, the work. There is a way to save it, and I don't even know that it's thin. I just kind of looking back here and knowing that I've dug in a little bit, that's the problem. Um, uh, if, oh, there's more wood than I thought. Knock that off. Yeah, I'm still not below. So I probably could put a nice curve in here and still uh, have enough wood in there so it won't <laughs> sound tinny. But if it did sound tinny, I would take the, uh, the interior form and instead of continuing it a flowing curve, I would actually take that curve and start rolling it up. And, and we'll, we'll just call that little high spot the gravy bump. You don't want the juice to settle in the middle. You'll keep it on the side. Uh, but that, that at least gives you the bulk that you want down there. And it, um, uh, it, the eye doesn't pick it up because it's a soft round instead of a harsh bump. So here's a traditional gouge here to finish up. just a little flatter than I normally would just to keep a little more bulk in here. I'm trying to think of how that feels. I like to put my hand there to see that it feels all right. little nub right there at the dead center. Come on, man. <coughs> ah, I just dug a hole in. Can't get my tool rest any lower. Interesting. All right. Let me sand that, and I'll just pass this tool around here. This is just a larger version of the traditional gouge. Uh, that, you notice I didn't use any scraping blades in there because that would, in this case, just break all that wood up because uh, there's a little bit of fiddle back in there. All this grain jetting out of here would just rip right up with, uh, with the uh, uh, scraping blades. So I don't scrape that surface just for that reason. All right, there's some, uh, actually I think I need a little bit more attention. And it was 150. And I'm also knocking off any sharp edges that I might have here too. But I'm not knocking the detail out of the work. That's the problem. You can always tell somebody that they've over sanded it is by knocking out details uh, that you may have done with your tool that you wanted, but they're gone. There's some 220. <laughs> uh, Carl, we'll pass that around real quick. I know uh, a lot of folks want, would want to see that. It, it's not sanded great, but that could be a nice item. Uh, being that it's a maple, uh, it could be used in the kitchen daily <coughs> and uh, shouldn't have any problems uh, for sure. Um, I know there was lots of things we, we could have touched on that I didn't. Um, uh, and, uh, Tony, are we going to do something about the pepper mills now? Oh, go ahead and take your take <laughs> take a break. Oh, take a break. Yeah. Take a break.